are seeing opportunities on par with the dot-com boom in the 90s and mobile in the early 2000s. When business models don't rely on ads, when revenue doesn't depend on marketing, when fundraising can come from anywhere, and when talent is globally distributed, the startup playbook is flipped on its head. Concepts like fundraising, exiting, and equity are being reframed. The narrative arc of company building that Silicon Valley knows and loves is shifting. How does a pitch deck for a company building on the open internet differ from a traditional startup's pitch deck? So I think for any founder that's thinking through how to structure their pitch deck for an open web startup, or a DAO, which I'll use synonymously with open web startup in this conversation, a lot of the same elements are gonna appear in the pitch deck as would in a traditional startup company. So um, in any case, investors are gonna want to know the core thesis behind the project, a description of the product, who the team is behind the product, um, some analysis of the market size. And I think all of that will be kind of consistent across the two. Where things start to really differ is around kind of the financial or economic slides, as well as user growth strategy. So one way to think of this is in the Web2 world or the traditional startup world, a pitch deck uh, would sell kind of what the lifetime value of a customer would be or its LTV. It'll look at stats like the cost of user acquisition and kind of go to these basic business metrics to understand what are the unit economics of this business. Um, broadly, what's being done here is you're trying to convince investors that the ability to de develop these network effects in your company are effective. And when you develop these network effects, you're actually going to monetize those effectively as a business. The typical VC model is companies raise a lot of VC money and then effectively give it away to early users as a way to subsidize those users to come onto this network. You can see this in many forms, such as referral fees to users, uh, customer credits, discounts. Sometimes companies even give users cash directly. You could see that in the case of neobanks and, and fintech businesses. Now, flipping that to open web companies, you still have the same broad goal of developing network effects. But the interesting thing here is you actually don't need to give away VC money to incent users to a new platform. You can actually build a system which rewards and incentivizes early users in the protocol or DAO itself. And you do this through a crypto mechanism called liquidity mining. Early users that come to a new platform earn a form of equity in that platform. Some blockchain projects have the potential to completely upend the architecture of the internet and redesign networks and business models that are not hindered by demographics or geography. How should open internet founders explain TAM? I think a great historical example here is um, when you look at applications like Uber or Airbnb, it was easy in the early days to say the TAM of Uber is the largest taxi company or the TAM of Airbnb is the largest hotel business. But in fact, that was massively underestimating um, the true size of that market because those businesses enabled new behaviors that were sort of unprecedented. They actually expanded the size of the market as we know it today. The other thing, you mentioned DeFi a lot. Well, Silicon Valley became big because it was all about the physical proximity of people. Uh, you know, 30 mile radius for VCs. I remember speaking to a VC who would only invest in startups that he could skateboard to. Um, what's, um, what effect do you think this de decentralized route is going to have on founders? I mean, you know, we're talking about new kinds of apps and uh, platforms being developed basically anywhere. It's going to have an absolutely tremendous effect and be very impactful in a good way. So one of my personal tests for the success of the internet computer is that it would enable somebody who's smart and determined 
in a developing world nation, um, such as uh, you know a computer nerd based in Lagos, Nigeria, to build, launch, finance, and make successful a mass market internet service. So uh, with the internet computer, someone is going to be able to build an internet service using, for example, a low-cost Chromebook where they just write smart contract code, push it straight up onto the internet computer, um, get their prototype internet service going, um, convert it into an open internet service, so start selling the governance tokens to um, you know, raise funds for development, uh, or, or using the governance tokens to incentivize other developers uh, all around the world who are connected to the internet to start participating in building out the internet service. So, I mean, one of the um, biggest challenges that I hope we can fix is that today, you know, only a small fraction of the world's potential talent is able to have a shot at building an internet service. And for the most part, it's people located here in, in Silicon Valley. You can do it in Europe, but it's much harder. Um, but in other places, it's you know, several times even more difficult. And the internet computer can help level the playing field so that you know, the, the remaining 99% of the world's talent gets a shot at building the internet of the future. So this concept of an exit is completely flipped on its head. So, you know, a founder is no longer in this infrastructure attempting to develop a technology and then, you know, seven years later, sell it to Google for $50 million. A hundred percent. An exit in this Web3 space is you want to exit to your community, regardless of the platform regardless of the application or the use case, whether it's a DeFi protocol or whether it's you know a new open version of YouTube or Reddit or whatever, um, the goal in this space for all entrepreneurs should be figuring out a way to eventually be able to exit to your community and early users. And then instead of you, know, you hiring a marketing team and trying to acquire all the users yourself, your users, your community, essentially become your marketing force. It's not like Bitcoin is paying a marketing agency to market Bitcoin. Every single person in the world who holds Bitcoin is the marketing department for Bitcoin. And that is much stronger and much more effective when we look back 20 years from now and understand, like, how did these tech giants go down? It's like, oh, they lost to these new newcomers who actually distributed value fairly to everyone involved who was adding value to that network or platform. It's gonna be like, oh, well, that seems obvious. I simply don't think that, I mean, looking at something like a decentralized social network and saying that it's going to have the same adoption as um, Facebook or Twitter uh, or Instagram is basically to me like saying that a vegetarian restaurant is going to have the same uh, allure as McDonald's. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. And I don't think that's what vegetarian restaurants are setting out to do. I think that they're setting out to offer something that is uh, perhaps healthier for you, perhaps better for the environment. And uh, if you aren't interested in that, there's no shame in going and getting a Big Mac, right? It's what matters is the choice. If you care about these things, if you think that the uh, society is better served, the planet is better served, your social circle is better served by making these choices, you can go down the capsule route, the vegetarian route, I guess. Um, and that can have a significant impact on uh, the way that you write and uh, discuss and share uh, content and interact with people on the internet. Robinhood has been under scrutiny from regulators and users alike. Recent issues have ranged from platform outages to selling order information to high frequency traders to backlash for restricting trading of certain stocks like GameStop. 
As founders of a decentralized exchange, what do you think Robinhood could have done better? So one thing that as a centralized exchanges have, they have some limitations. If it is a technical problem, then they could have uh, anticipated this demand. They could have architected a little differently, more robustly, so that the when the when there's a lot of people trying to summon order, then there are ways to handle this a little more gracefully. And fundamentally, too, um, decentralized exchanges don't have that problem, right? We are a lot of decentralized components are actually running on, say, the Divinity Internet Computer or on decentralized blockchains. Those are pretty much always up. So if you architect around more decentralized components, then you offload that to a really resilient system because blockchains aren't just running one exchange. They're running the whole Internet Computer or the, a ton of different apps, and they all have to run. Microsoft bought LinkedIn for $26 billion. And LinkedIn has reported that it sees 260 million monthly active users. So those are both pretty big numbers. Tell us, what is wrong with LinkedIn and why do we need a decentralized version of a professional social network? What's wrong with LinkedIn is basically, if you look at the core of the issue, what's wrong with all social media networks right now, um, there's obviously data issue, privacy issues. We have a lot of misinformation. We have the platforming going on. It's, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, and it all uh, sums up to the fact that they're centralized and built on these uh, proprietary systems. There's a need for a platform like LinkedIn. We need to enjoy social media. There's not an, uh, a problem with the social networks themselves. We need a place to showcase our talents, to talk about our achievements. There's a lot of positive things that a professional social media network can do for the world, but we don't need to pay for all those benefits with our data and our privacy. We can actually have them, enjoy them, and uh, you know have the dignity of owning our data and the power of controlling those platforms. 